very excited to do this type of collaborative program. Uh, professor Gorski is an associate professor of integrative studies at George Mason University, New Century College, he teach, where he teaches classes on class and poverty, educational equity, animal rights, and environmental justice. He recently designed the new social justice undergraduate program and minor there as well. He has been an active consultant, presenter, and trainer for nearly 20 years. He looks young. He looks too young for that. But conducting workshops and providing guidance to schools and community organizations committed to equity and diversity. He created and continues to maintain the Multicultural Pavilion, an award-winning website focused on critical multicultural education. Paul is serving his second term on the Board of Directors of the International Association for Intercultural Education. He has published four books and more than 40 articles and publications such as Educational Leadership, Equity and Excellence in Education, Rethinking Schools, Teaching and Teacher Education, Teachers College Record, and Teaching Maryland and teaching, that's a separate magazine. Maryland had um, teaching tolerance. Prior to his current position, Paul taught the University of Virginia, <coughs> University of Maryland, and Hamlin University. He continues to publish and present in education-focused forums on topics including white privilege and racism, anti-poverty education and economic justice, and multicultural organizational transformation. He lives in Washington, D.C. with his cats, Unity and Buster. <laughs> and I understand from today, he's also an adjunct professor for us here at Berea College. So please join me in welcoming our, our speaker, Mr. Paul Gibson. conversations about race frame racism as purely an interpersonal thing. You know, if we could just figure out how different racial groups can get along with one another, everything will be cheery and sweet. Then whack! Oh, it's institutional. It's bigger than individual relationships. Okay, I'm starting to get that. And then whack! Oh, it's global. It's connected to a history of imperialism and on and on and on. Now, I easily could deliver a talk about implicating myself at any of these levels. But recently, I'd say the last year or so, a couple of experiences conspired to give me the latest whack, and that whack flattened me. Next. Okay. Okay. Experience number one, the International Multicultural Institute, a nonprofit in Washington, D.C. Uh, I 
I used to do some work for them, sent an email uh, about who was receiving its annual Leading Lights Award for Workplace Diversity. One of the recipients was Sodexo, a copy with a long and worldwide history of human rights abuses. Sodexo actually has received several awards for workplace diversity. The idea, I guess, is that if you have a diverse workforce at the corporate headquarters, it doesn't matter that you refuse to pay workers in the field a living wage, or that you fire workers who are trying to unionize. It doesn't matter that human rights groups found that you were abusing workers in Colombia, the Dominican Republic, Guinea, Morocco, and the US, denying overtime pay or paying the lowest legal wages. Hey, even if you treat your most disenfranchised workers as disposable, as long as the suits in your corporate office play nice with one another, you get a diversity award. Now that got me thinking about the University of, this is a little bit more uh, information about Sodexo. Um, that got me thinking about the university where I work, which is George Mason University outside of Washington, D.C. It has been recognized and celebrated as one of the most diverse universities in the U.S. At the same time, the university is full of underpaid Sodexo workers, a vast majority of whom are people of color, and most of whom are immigrants. Sodexo runs Mason's Food Services. I believe it also runs uh, Berea's Food Services. I hate to think about how many times I went to a campus program on racism in higher education, then met some folks for lunch or dinner on campus to talk about the program, never raising the issue that by giving our money to Sodexo, we were actually contributing to racism. That makes me a hypocrite. Another experience. The middle of last year, I was editing an essay my partner Jennifer had written for a graduate class. She was writing about the exploitation of animals for human profit, and buried in her essay was this line. Animals don't exist for human entertainment, sport, or utility, and we ought not to deprive them of their vital needs to satisfy our trivial needs. Now take a moment to think about that. I haven't been able to stop thinking about it since I originally read her essay. Now, just for fun, or maybe the opposite of fun, if you have a purse or a bag or anything with you that has any kind of cosmetic whether it's lotion or hand sanitizer or makeup, just take out one item if you have, if you have a bag with you that has something like that. Chapstick, lip gloss, fingernail polish, uh, okay. Now, uh, look at that, look at that item. Look at the packaging. If that does not say on it somewhere, this product was not tested on animals, what that means is that the animals were tortured so that you could have that product. They were forced to ingest it. It was rubbed into their eyes. Let's see some pictures of what that looks like. Now, you might look at your hand sanitizer and think, that's not trivial to me. That's vital. Well, no, because you can buy shampoo and cosmetics that weren't tested on animals. It's less convenient, maybe. But if you have any leisure time at all, and if you can afford to pay a little more for those products, and I realize not everybody can, then that is an example of depriving living creatures of their vital needs to satisfy your trivial needs. Now, that example is about the exploitation of animals, about how... Um, that was an example of the exploitation about animals, how, how elephants or dolphins or race of horses or greyhound dogs are tortured to satisfy our trivial cravings for entertainment, how farm animals, uh, how farm animals are tortured to satisfy our trivial cravings for cheeseburgers or chicken breasts, how foxes and other animals are tortured to satisfy our absolutely senseless cravings for clothes made with fur so that we can all look as silly as her. That's, that's I, sh I shouldn't pick on Lindsay Lohan. I, I apologize. Um, and really, for me, that ought to be enough. These are living creatures, and research has begun to show how all animals have a consciousness 
that is similar to the human consciousness. They feel fear, they feel pain, they grieve, they know when they're being tortured. But then I got to thinking about this quote in a different way. This is my grandma. My mom's family is from poor Appalachian stock. They, like most people in Appalachia, were subsistence farmers at one time. Two industries put a terribly violent end to that, the coal industry and the lumber, lumber industry. And now remember, of course, that white people in that region themselves, when my people first moved there, were occupying land that in many parts of Appalachia were stolen from Native Americans. So we're talking about several layers of violence here. Coal and logging companies did so much destruction to the land with their clear cutting and runoff and their pollution of waterways that many poor subsistence farmers had to stop farming. And uh, what work was available to them? Uh, in the case of where my grandparents grew up, the, the men's choices were go into the military or go to work for one of these industries that is destroying your community. Uh, several, several of the most recent generations on my mom's side of the family were coal miners. Uh, then, like now, of course, as many of you know, coal mining is among the most dangerous exploitative industries. Now, I started thinking about grandma and the generations of men my family lost to black lung and cancer and other ailments associated with the coal mines. And I started thinking about the pristine beauty of Appalachia and how much of it has been destroyed right out under the poor people of every racial and ethnic background. And that helped me make the connection. Uh, and th this is really my hypocrisy here, which is that when it started happening to my people, that white Appalachian people, when it started happening to my people, all of a sudden I got some consciousness about it. Now, when I choose how I'm going to live, what I'm going to consume, what corporations I'm going to support, this is what I'm choosing. I'm choosing the extent to which I am going to deprive people, most especially disenfranchised people, poor people, people of color, children, of their vital needs to satisfy my trivial needs. I am choosing the extent to which I am willing to support the worst of global racism and sexism and economic injustice for the sake of convenience or for the sake of the social cachet that's attached for owning this or that trivial thing. So this is my topic for today's talk. I'm a hypocrite, and while it is true that I've dedicated most of my life to confronting racism and white privilege and economic injustice, and while I think I've done some pretty good and important social justice work in my life, it is equally true that even a basic reflection on the ways I participate in consumer culture, the everyday ways I live my life, that I contribute to what I have come to see as the most destructive forms of racism and economic injustice, the ways I deprive disenfranchised community of their vital needs in order to satisfy my trivial consumption needs. Now, I'm going to be talking about some pretty difficult stuff here, about connections among various types of violence that has taken me a whole 40-year lifetime, 41-year lifetime, to start talking, taking seriously. And that made me rethink just about everything I thought I knew about what, what it means to be a social justice educator and activist. So before I get into those examples, I want to share with you a couple of kind of cognitive tools that have helped me make sense of this mess of exploitation and how it's tied to my patterns of consumption. Uh, the first concept is intersectionality. How many of you are familiar with that term, intersectionality? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, then you probably know Kimberly Crenshaw coined this term to describe the recognition that different forms of identity and exploitation um, are intersectional. Uh, so intersectionality generally refers to uh, intersections between human identity categories and oppressions like sexism, racism, heterosexism, homophobia, and so on. Now, I have come to believe that the entire sphere of human identity and oppression can be placed with all of its complexities into an even bigger intersectional model. Um, and this intersectional model considers the relationship between human exploitation, environmental exploitation, and non-human animal exploitation. The thing that ties all these forms of exploitation together generally is the profit. These are all forms of exploitation that are part of a bigger system of economic-driven exploitation. Now, 
Uh, I want to clarify that I'm not making an argument here that the exploitation of animals is equal to the exploitation or immediacy of, of the immediacy of the exploitation of humans. Now, I think that's a philosophical debate for another day and another time. And also, comparing exploitations isn't very productive, as Audre Lorde uh, taught us. Still, I will say this, I find it hard to imagine that somebody could see images of gross animal abuse and exploitation, uh, like say, of bullfighting, that's bullfighting. We have something like this in the US, it's called the rodeo. Bullfighting, say, or animal testing, this photo comes from University of Wisconsin-Madison, that bastion of liberalism, uh, and not see it as part of a larger cycle of violence as part of the same culture of viciousness that includes medical testing on humans, uh, like the venereal disease research that the US performed on unwitting Guatemalans in the 1940s, as well as other forms of oppression. And, you know, give the animal their credit, even some animals know how to protest. <laughs> Might take a second. Okay. Okay, so again, I'm not trying to make a direct comparison here, but what I am saying is this. It's all part of the same system of exploitation, and it all has one thing at its center, and that's profit. Uh, a majority of corporations and industries will do anything, anything, to uh, make a profit. They will torture animals just so they will entertain humans. They will chop off the tops of mountains. They will use child labor and then claim that a portion of their proceeds go to ch children's causes. They will literally kill people or at least create the conditions to ensure people's deaths. The underlying issue is the violence, the exploitation. And I believe condoning any of it by purchasing products from these companies or industries is at least implicitly like condoning all of it. Now, if I'm going to claim that I'm for justice, that I'm for an end to oppression, and I put my trivial needs ahead of the needs of, ahead of the vital needs of people or of any living creature, that makes me a hypocrite. And this is something I do over and over and over. So you'll see as I talk through my examples that I look at these intersections, I consider all of these forms of exploitation. I put human exploitation at the center of the conversation, but I just don't see an honest way of talking through this without pointing to animal and environmental exploitation. Which, by the way, as we'll see, also contributes to the exploitation of the most disenfranchised humans. So this is my second concept, which is the concept of macroaggressions. How many of you are familiar with the term microaggression? Anyone familiar with that? Okay. So uh, this term sort of became part of the racial justice lexicon about 10 years or so ago. Uh, a person who really comes from the uh, counseling and psychology disciplines named Daryl Wayne Sue might be best known for writing about microaggressions and defining them, as you see up here, as brief, or up there, as brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or uh, environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults toward people of color. Now, I know that this term itself is kind of a contested term, and sometimes see it, some people see it as kind of a distraction from talking about bigger systems of, uh, of racial injustice. But I think that we all recognize that the things that Daryl Wing Su describes up here, we would all recognize that as, as oppressive or discriminatory, wouldn't we? Wouldn't you look at that and say, yeah, that looks like discrimination to me. Now, some people have used the term macroaggression instead of microaggression to refer to purposeful, overt forms of discrimination. But this is a little confusing to me because macro, as a prefix, uh, does not mean purposeful or overt. It means large in scope. It's referring to big picture. So I think about macroaggressions differently. To me, a macroaggression is an instance in which I participate in a big system of oppression rather than an interpersonal form of bias or discrimination. So the, the idea of macroaggression shares with microaggressions the quality of not necessarily being purposeful. In other words, when I talk about how badly I need a piece of furniture made out of a hardwood, 
I don't necessarily link that in the moment to logging, to clear cutting forests, to destroying the habitats of uh, animals and the communities of my own people, or, or of indigenous communities who count on the rainforest for their survival. I don't necessarily think about that in the, in the moment. In the same way, when I eat at KFC, I don't link that to the horrendous work conditions of low-income people, largely people of color, largely immigrant workers at KFC's chicken farms, or to the fact that Greenpeace found that KFC was using wood from Indonesian rainforest hardwood trees to make their food boxes. I don't think about this in the moment. I certainly didn't think about the torture experience by the chicken I was eating. I might have thought about the workers at the KFC where I was eating, but I didn't think about the people all over the world working in horrific conditions, picking the lettuce and tomato on my chicken sandwich. Now, there are countless systems of oppression, endless ways to macro aggress, and I've participated in many of them. I've gotten married. A lot of people, because of heterosexism and homophobia, would argue that that in and of itself is, can be to some people a, a macro aggressive system. I've participated in a very oppressive tenure and promotion system at my university. I've deposited money at big exploitative banks, the banks that do predatory lending. In each of these cases, I didn't purposefully go out and oppress anybody. But I did participate in systems that are very oppressive, particularly to people who are already disenfranchised. These are the sorts of things that make me a hypocrite, that make me a racist, a sexist, a heterosexist. Uh, and these are what I call macroaggression. Now, if you're struggling to come up with ways that you might macro-aggress, um, <laughs> consider this cartoon. Now, if I am a white person and I am occupying this continent, I am macro-aggressive. Uh, participating in a centuries-long occupation of land that does not belong to me is itself macro-aggressive. Now, nobody who is sitting in here is meaning to oppress anybody in doing this. Nobody's thinking about the long history of the occupation of other people's land. I don't think people think about that on a day-to-day -day basis. But it is an example of participating in colonization and imperialism. It is an example of participating in a system that has been hugely oppressive to a lot of people. Now that, by the way, might explain some of the tension in the Occupy movement. There's a lot of white liberals seeing themselves as super progressive, but who are also unwilling to recognize the space they're consuming, the voices they're silencing, the land they are already occupying. So I can't imagine how there can be any real cross-race organizing for racial or economic justice until people like me, white people, turn that lens on ourselves. Um, many other macroaggressions and the ones I feel I've been most intently socialized to participate in are related to what I consume, how I spend money, the destruction I'm supporting in that way. Now I'd like to talk about three examples of these macroaggressions, three examples of how being the kind of consumer I am makes me a hypocrite when it comes to racial justice. These are the three that uh, I'm going to talk about. Number one, I've spent most of my life eating food that was grown and produced on factory farms. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Number two, I've spent most of my life consuming beverages from some of the most racist and imperialist companies in the world, like Coca-Cola. Number three, I've spent most of my life purchasing and wearing shoes and clothes from some of the most racist, economically unjust companies in the world, like Nike. These are three of the countless examples of how I help to deny already disenfranchised people their vital needs in service to my most trivial uh, consumerist needs. Now, these three examples I picked purposefully because, you know, Nike and Coca-Cola, these are the huge companies that everyone knows, and so they get picked on. But the truth is, Coca-Cola is no worse than Pepsi-Cola. Not sure about RC-Cola. They still exist. I could really use a great knee high right now, so people don't even know what that is. Um, but I'm picking on them just because we're, we're familiar with them. In many ways, I could pick just about any, uh, just about any uh, wealthy corporation. So let's start with uh, factory farming, eating factory farming meat. Now, obviously, 
there is a cost to the animals, right? Uh, does anybody know what's happening there, what that's a picture of? It is a picture of chicks. You want more specific? Those are male chicks on an egg farm. Well, what do you think happens to male chicks on an egg farm? Well, according to that sign, they get ground up alive. <laughs> yes. Uh, they get ground up alive. Sometimes they get drowned. Sometimes if they're not already suffocating. Because male chicks born on a chicken farm are useless. Uh, it's a different breed of chicken. They can't be grown for meat. Uh, so what they do is they're born. They separate the genders. They keep the female chicks. The male chicks uh, usually are put through a wood grinder and uh, ground up uh, alive. Those are not peeps, uh, as I say that. So, okay, so this part is obvious. Animals, living creatures, are seen as property, not protected. There are animal cruelty laws in the U.S. Uh, uh, they're some of the weakest uh, in the Western industrialized world, but farm animals are not covered under animal cruelty laws in the U.S. So pigs, which are actually smarter than dogs, spend their lives in cages too small to turn around. Chickens are kept in cages too small to spread their wings. Many animals never step foot outside a cage, never see the sun. Even if, they're in a, even if it says cage-free, that doesn't mean that they're out in a pasture somewhere. Cage-free could just mean they're in a big barn with no windows in it, and they're just not in cages. They're just stuffed into, uh, stuffed into uh, bars. Animals are fed diets that are unnatural to them. Most animals naturally don't eat corn, but they get a lot of uh, cornmeal. Uh, to make them grow as quickly as possible. Chicken on a chickens on a factory farm grow at a rate about seven times what is natural to them. Male chicks born on an egg farm, uh, well, here I guess you already know. My speech says, well, you don't want to know what happens to them, but we already talked about it. So, uh, so there's more, there's, there's a lot more there. But, uh, and again, I, you know, I do feel like it's important to say here that I'm not equating, I'm not trying to equate, I'm not trying to do the oppression Olympics here, or trying to equate this violence with racism or violence against human. But I am saying that it's part of the same system of violence. Um, and it's carried out for the same reason. They are put through wood chipper because nobody wants to pay for them to have an actual life. So we kill them. Uh, at basically at birth. Um, and by the way, who do you think disproportionately is feeling the, the toll of this kind of destruction? Who do you imagine is tasked with the most gruesome kinds of violence that happen on factory farms? Now, I'm not talking about neighborhood farms here. I'm talking about big industrial factory farms. Um, I'll give you a hint. It's not wealthy white people doing that stuff. So given that, I do have to say that violence to animals, to living creatures with a consciousness, ought to be enough, really, I think, for people to stop eating factory farm meat if they can afford to do so. It ought to be enough for those of us with any sense of justice to say, that's a system I don't want to support. But, of course, I'm a hypocrite. I became a vegan just a couple years ago, at the age of 38. I spent most of my life eating meat at every meal, something almost nobody in the world did just a few generations ago. Now think about that. How many of you eat meat with almost every meal? Raise your hand. Okay, many of you. Now, if you go back just a, a couple of generations, nobody, even wealthy families, didn't eat meat at every meal. Nobody did that. That, that need that people perceive is an invention of meat industries. That's an invention of meat industries. Okay, but there's, there's more than just the animal treatment. There's treatment of workers on factory farms. Often workers on factory farms are undocumented immigrants, paid below the minimum wage, always paid below a living wage. Outside the U.S. it's the same. Even if factory farms are located uh, in predominantly white countries, the workers almost never are predominantly white, almost always are immigrants, migrants, people of color who are paid well below a living wage. They work in squalid conditions, surrounded by feces and disease, Virtually none of them has health insurance, nor are they uh, consistently equipped with the kind of safety equipment that would keep them safe from disease and injuries. One of the evil benefits, the racist benefits, of hiring undocumented immigrants on factory farms in the U.S. is that undocumented workers are unlikely to seek medical attention 
if they get injured on the job, so safety hazards and workplace injuries go unreported. That's more profit for the corporations that own or contract with these factory farms, including every fast food restaurant at which you've ever eaten, and likely uh, 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 the food services at, at this college and most colleges and universities. Uh, in 2005, uh, Human Rights Watch reported uh, what you see here. Meat and poultry industry employers set up the workplaces and practices that create these dangers, but they, retreat, they treat the resulting mayhem as a normal, natural part of the production process, not as what it is, repeated violations of international human rights standards. Uh, other labor rights are uh, at issue at factory farms, adversely affecting the most, uh, mostly undocumented uh, immigrant workers. In many cases, employers have threatened to contact, or in fact have contacted, federal authorities regarding workers' immigration status in order to intimidate them into dropping charges of unfair labor practices. Excuse me. Uh, realize uh, these are among the least healthy possible jobs, especially from air contaminants. So being able to report health, risk, health risks is literally a matter of life and death for these workers. Um, over 9,000 farm workers and laborers died from work-related injuries behind, uh, between 1992 and 2009. Uh, so let's get even more specific, because I used to love me a Brazilian steakhouse. Uh, now I know this, many Brazilian cattle farms use what's called debt bondage to trap workers, the sort of thing that mining companies have done in the U.S. You work for us, we force you to pay us for rent and goods and equipment, and before you know it, you work for us full time, but somehow you're also in debt to us. Um, U.S. companies profit from this kind of exploitation all over the world. Restaurants in the U.S. that make uh, people in the U.S. wealthier. Uh, many farms in Latin America and elsewhere also use armed guards or paid militias to enforce their rules to physically discourage unions, and to generally intimidate workers. Um, and this will become a theme, as you see. Uh, so now then, eating factory farmed meat is violent, not just to animals, but also to workers, most of whom are people of color, often immigrants, always poor. That was never my intent, of course, when I ordered a side of bacon or ate ice cream. But what do we always say about racism? The intent is less important than the impact. The impact is racism. And there's more. Child labor. Child labor is widespread on factory farms, especially when it comes to children of migrant families, because their parents might be paid little more, little more than a slave wage. So for example, in 2008, Iowa labor uh, investigators found 57 underage child, children workers at a kosher meat packing plant in Postville, Iowa, most of whom are from Guatemala. So even these places that sort of uh, use labels to claim that they're being more responsible are still contributing to this. Uh, then there's the water and soil contamination, and guess who that hurts the most? The contamination affects miles and miles of surrounding land, almost always in poor rural areas where people have little economic clout to fight back. The pollution from animal waste causes respiratory problems, uh, skin infections, depression, and even death for people who live near factory farms. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, the runoff from factory farms pollutes our waterways more than all other industrial sources combined. This affects all of us, but the people who experience the most immediate, most damaging effects in the U.S., aside from the workers themselves, are poor rural people whose surface water and even groundwater are being contaminated. So this is injustice, injustice, injustice. And really, I'm just getting started here. Um, so let's take a step back and think about food security. Studies from both the World Bank and Britain's Department for International Development, again, these aren't exactly bastions of progressivism, have shown that the spread of factory farming in the developing world is harming the poorest people, especially indigenous communities, and actually reducing food security. Small farms go out of business because they can't compete with factory farms that are owned, run, and contracted mostly by U.S. and Western European corporations. So there's that direct human cost. You know, the same way we might fight 
uh, to keep Walmart from opening up and closing a bunch of local businesses. Also think about this, factory farming consumes about 40% of the world's grain harvest, 40%, uh, and that's for feeding the animals. There's a lot of hungry people in the world, and this is not an efficient way to feed them. It basically guarantees widespread food scarcity. And guess again who's most likely to go hungry. Livestock production uses 15% of all irrigated water globally, while 2 billion people suffer from water scarcity. Speaking of water scarcity. <laughs> okay, and then there's the environment. Factory farms contribute directly to global warming. They release huge amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, more than the entire global transportation industry and all other industries combined. So these movements about riding a bike or walking instead of driving, if we all just stopped eating meat from factory farms, that would make a far bigger impact on the environment uh, than, than uh, stuff in riding bikes. Or, we should do both, right? Um, in fact, studies last year by former World Bank environmental advisors found that factory farming accounts for about 51% of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. And that means that more than anything, more than transportation or any kind of production, factory farming is a leading cause of human-generated climate change. So if you ride your bike or you, uh, to cut down on your carbon footprint, you could cut it down much, much further if you cut down on your consumption of of food produced on factory farms. Um, and try to remember too that the most immediate negative impact of climate change is on poor people, especially people of color, especially poor indigenous communities all over the world. That's called systemic racism. Participating in that is racism. Systemic racism, that's a macular aggression. Uh, here's another kind of interesting thing. Uh, just think about a burger and a Coke, a kind of lunch that one of you might have had today. Two pounds of, it takes two pounds of grain to produce one-fourth pound of beef. Two pounds of grain to produce a quarter pound of beef. It takes 600 gallons of water to produce one quarter pound burger. 600 gallons of water. Water for the animal and to grow the grain that feeds the animal and to process the meat. It takes one gallon of water to produce an orange. One gallon to produce an orange. Okay, so I'm gonna go on to my next piece here. So, I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> Still a hypocrite. Okay, drinking Coca-Cola. And believe me, this pains me because I crave Diet Coke, which is basically a mixture of unnatural chemicals. Uh, that are basically designed to make you addicted to the product. That's basically. Um, okay, so my, my Diet Coke addiction as an example of macroaggression. Okay, so for years I was addicted to Diet Coke. A Diet Coke with a slice of lime, that was my thing. Very sophisticated with my slice of lime. <laughs> and I still crave it. Um, and that isn't much of a surprise because Coca-Cola products are made to be addictive. Those bottomless cups of Coke at restaurants, those super big gulps. That's not just about people having a voracious appetite for what basically is a combination of nutrient-less and harmful chemicals. It's about making you an addict to their product. Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, just about every processed food company that makes everything from drinks to chips to cookies, they're in the business of accumulating addicts. I heard uh, a radio story about Pringles who spent several million dollars uh, hiring a company to try to figure out what would make people more addicted to the product. And what they figured out was that they could get the crunch to be louder, that people like, and when you watch commercials with potato chips, it's all about the crunch, right? So that's part of the addiction, and they spend millions of dollars trying to figure that out. Uh, and who do they prey on uh, more than anybody else? Poor communities all over the world, poor communities and communities of color and youth. Now, more on this in a second. But let's begin here. Good old-fashioned racism and a long history of it. In his very last speech before he was assassinated, Martin Luther King Jr. actually called for a boycott of Coca-Cola for discriminating against black workers and its Atlanta plant. And the company is still discriminating. Most recently, 
16 plaintiffs, including African American, Latino, and Jamaican immigrant workers, have described racism in New York area Coca Cola plants from biased work assignments to unfair disciplinary practices to retaliation for complaining about racism at work. When I started examining my racist hypocrisies, uh, looking at Coca Cola's treatment of workers, the environment, and consumers, especially poor consumers, I was horrified that uh, I ever had handed that company one penny. In Colombia, armed guards at Coca-Cola, at a Coca-Cola bottling plant, have falsely imprisoned union leaders and organizers who are seeking safer working conditions and living wages. The bottling company hires local paramilitary, um, this is very common, by the way, for uh, US corporations in Latin America. They will hire local paramilitary uh, fruit Corporations in Colombia, uh, very uh, much like this, um, and they will, you know. So if anybody does start speaking up, uh, they uh, are threatened with violence. The bottling company uh, hires local paramilitary and security forces and union busters. These forces literally have murdered, tortured, kidnapped, and unlawfully detained trade union leaders. This is a common practice among a lot of U.S. multinational corporations that have operations in developing countries. Coca-Cola denies these charges, big surprise, uh, but always refuses to allow independent investigators to examine the situation. In Guatemala, Coca-Cola managers and armed security guards have been accused of rape, murder, and attempted murder against trade unionists and their families. In Turkey, in 2005, 105 workers at a Coke bottling plant joined a union and were immediately fired. When they and their families protested peacefully, they were attacked at the plant by Turkish riot police. Many were badly beaten and, and uh, goes on and on. In China, 2008, an undercover investigation revealed that many workers were forced to work 12-hour days without any days off and with uh, inadequate protective equipment. Their pay often was cut for no reason, and workers who requested back pay were beaten. Uh, Coca-Cola has been found to be benefiting, benefiting also from prison labor in many of these countries. Same issues in Mexico, El Salvador, uh, India. And this isn't just Coca-Cola, as I mentioned. Pepsi's list of atrocities is just as long. And it's not just about exploiting workers. It's about uh, destroying uh, water systems and fighting to privatize water sources, uh, which has been especially devastating uh, to poor and indigenous communities all over the world. Coca-Cola worked with then Mexican President Vicente Fox, who once was, uh, who once actually was president of Coca-Cola's Latin American operations, to privatize water in Mexico. And you can't get much, imperial, much more imperialist than privatizing water. Uh, Coca-Cola has been destroying water systems in India, draining out groundwater and destroying vast amounts of farming land, causing an estimated $48 million and damage in one of the poorest region, regions of one of the highest poverty countries in the world. Um, and of course, many of you probably know that Coca-Cola also is monopolizing local markets, uh, such as in India, by buying out uh, local uh, beverage companies all over the world. There's one company in Colombia that's holding out that, that won't sell. It's kind of become the cause of celebration. Uh, uh, they're also preying on the poorest communities, and you see that in this picture. I don't know why I keep pointing over there. Uh, Coca-Cola advertises in the U.S. and overseas most voraciously in the poorest communities, where people already are undernourished and have little access to health care or dental care or clean water. Uh, there literally are parts of Latin America and India where you can't walk in any direction without being bombarded with Coca-Cola advertisements. And some of you may know about some of the history of Mountain Dew as well uh, in the U.S. and its, its uh, efforts to get people addicted to it, uh, in, especially in parts of Appalachia. Uh, now, believe me, I can tell you that part of me would love a Diet Coke with a slice of lime right now. I think you'd find me pretty sophisticated if I was drinking mm -hmm. that. But that desire is an example of privilege, as, of a sense of entitlement. It's not something that I need. When, when I say I need a Diet Coke, I don't need a Diet Coke. Um, it's another example of putting my trivial needs ahead of other less privileged people's vital needs. Given the treatment of low-wage workers, um, 
Uh, given the child labor and the use of militia, uh, uh, how can I claim to be about social justice while I purchase and consume products made by Coca-Cola? Uh, if that's not enough, let's talk about plastic bottles. People in the U.S. drink more bottled water, and uh, the biggest selling bottled water in the U.S. are actually uh, sub-companies owned by Coca-Cola. People in the U.S. drink more bottled water than people in any other country. We purchase a ridiculous 29 billion bottles every year. Um, making the plastic bottle, making the plastic for all those bottles uses 17 million barrels of crude oil annually. That's about equal to the amount of fuel required to keep one million vehicles on the road for an entire year. So if you have a bottle of water with you right now, imagine filling one quarter of it with oil. That's the amount used to produce that bottle. Then there's this, roughly 1,500 plastic bottles end up either in landfills or in the ocean. That's 1,500 bottles every second of every day. And of course, where are landfills most likely to be located? And I'll give you another hint. It's not near wealthy white neighborhoods. OK, going on to my third example, Nikes. So I'm going to use Nike as an example here. I could choose nearly any popular shoe or clothing company, but I'm choosing Nike because I've been playing basketball for most of my life, and I always, always, always have said I need Nike basketball shoes. Here's a photo of my current basketball shoes that are Converse. Then I realized Nike bought out Converse. Right? So I've always said they fit me best. Nikes fit me best. I had paid ridiculous amounts of money for Nike shoes, which really had nothing to do with fit and everything to do with that swoosh symbol, the symbol associated by some people with athletic prowess, with Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods, but associated by other people, a lot of other people, mostly poor people, uh, with awful sorts of oppression. So let's think about this for a minute. I need Nike shoes. I often find myself and hear others using the word need to describe these sorts of trivial desires, and because I've been suckered into a consumerist frenzy, I pretend that it's a vital need. I need Nike shoes. Nobody needs Nike shoes. Nobody. It's like when I became a vegetarian, I would tell myself the reason I wouldn't become a vegan, even though I knew it was the right thing for me to do, was that I couldn't give up cheese. I would actually say that. I'd love to be a vegan, but I can't give up cheese. Uh, uh, given the whole history of human existence, only a tiny, tiny fraction of people ever have tasted cheese. <coughs> uh, to put it in sort of white privilege terms, that statement of me, that sense of entitlement to something so trivial, is the worst kind of privilege. Uh, uh, it's the worst of what sits right at the intersection of white privilege and economic privilege. I am entitled to this land. I am entitled to this job. I am entitled to consume whatever the hell I want to consume regardless of who is exploited. So I never needed Nikes, but I've probably bought 25 pairs of them over the course of my life. So why does this make me a racist and a macroaggressor? Just 10 years ago, Nike faced criticism for slave-like child labor in its overseas factories. Almost all of this was in Southeast Asian uh, developing countries whose workers regularly are exploited by US corporations that make wealthy white people wealthier. We can point to all sorts of abuse of low-wage workers in Indonesia, including physical abuse and sweatshop conditions that would be illegal in the US. Some of the most egregious examples in Indonesia were, were, in Indonesia were found in a plant where most of the 10,000 workers are women who earn about 50 cents an hour. Nike dodges responsibility for these abuses by saying that they're happening in factories run by contractors. So Nike, one of the most powerful businesses in the history of the world, can't be held responsible for conditions because they've outsourced work to contractors. I call bullshit. <laughs> Following what has become a theme in my example, sweatshops used by Nike have been shown to have close ties with the Indonesian military. Workers at these sweatshops have claimed that Nike factories pay the military to intimidate them. Also, facilities producing Nikes in Indonesia have been caught dumping factory waste uh, into waterways, destroying local natural resources on which thousands of poor people rely. 
In Vietnam, activists uncovered that workers at the Nike facility were forced to work 65-hour work weeks for 15 to 20 cents per hour. In Haiti, workers were paid 30 cents per hour, and in many cases, this work is done in the most demeaning, dangerous conditions. In the Vietnam plant, for example, chemicals causing liver, kidney, and brain damage were found to be at 177 times the legal limit. So, so with whom, I have to ask, have I been standing? Uh, with, with them, with the activists, with people who are pushing back against the exploitation, with people who I claim to be connected with because of my activism? Oh, I didn't have the picture. With them? Or with them? Nike is alone, by the way. Recently, I saw a list of clothing brands that are known to have abusive practices in developing countries. There's some of them. I've owned clothes from many of them. And so, okay, so I think you get the point. I think you get the point that I'm a hypocrite. I'm a macro oppressor who contributes to all sorts of oppressions against already disenfranchised people. And I really have come to believe this. I cannot rightly call myself a fighter for racial justice uh, while I continue to consume as I have spent my life consuming. I have come to believe that buying Nike shoes, purchasing Coca-Cola products, eating factory farm meat, among many, many other ways of support oppressive systems, um, is just as racist, just as oppressive as any other kind of racism. And this has been kind of a revelation to me, a difficult revelation, because it's forced me to rethink just about everything about how I live my life. Um, I also know that when it comes to being a hypocrite, I'm in good company. Uh, that's Gandhi. Uh, recently, I was reading a speech that Gandhi uh, gave, and he talked about this, about how important to him being a vegetarian was. So he was making this uh, connection. But what he said later in the same speech kind of blew me away. What he said later in the speech was basically that one of the biggest tragedies of his life was that he did not become a vegan. And I thought, okay, Gandhi's a hypocrite, right? He's calling himself a hypocrite. We're all hypocrites. And in some ways it's okay. In some ways it's okay, but we all have to find a way that we can, uh, we can be better about this. So uh, I'm just gonna sort of close here with saying uh, that, uh, just skipping ahead a little bit here. Uh, so I'm not asking us to feel ashamed or guilty, uh, unless that works for you, if you're ashamed or guilty. I'm asking us to be mindful. So the same critical lenses we put on other forms of discrimination, we should also uh, put on, on this. Uh, I'm asking us to be mindful, to apply those critical lenses, to consider a robust vision of racial and economic justice that includes taking stock of the ways in which we participate in these consumerist systems of uh, racial and economic uh, oppression. Again, it's not about feeling guilty to me, it's about being mindful, it's about being thoughtful, uh, and it's about being consistent in my values. And this is something I trip over myself doing, trying to do every day, and anyone who tries to do it, we're always going to be tripping over ourselves, but it's about striving, it's about striving. And that's the uh, goal I will leave you with. Doesn't mean you have to give up all meat, but it means, you know, maybe I'll try once a week not to eat meat and see how that goes. Or maybe I'll just be a little more thoughtful about where these eggs are coming from. It's just, it's about that. It's about that. So um, I think we're uh, maybe a few minutes if anyone has questions. Um, so there's my contact information if you want to contact me. And, uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll take some questions if anybody comes up. Questions or comments or criticisms?
has to do that, and it has to do with, the, with just waste in general. Waste on pig farms is, is really a terrible, yeah. awful. Well, I mean, apparently a huge portion of like, carbon emissions come from cow flatulence. And that is something that just seems like it should be so ridiculous. I'm off with the elimination of flatulence. <laughs> of all forms. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting when you start looking into it and, and how all of the ways in which these factory farms are um, doing things to basically increase the profit, giving the, the, the cheapest possible fee uh, that they, they can provide and, and, uh, and everything else. Yes, it is subsidized. Yes. So, how do you suggest that people without the means to, per, per se, go vegan or purchase fair trade clothing. I mean, there is a, a premium markup on anything that seems to be fair that we'd be able to consume in the constructs of the society. Yeah. What do you suggest people can get for? Yeah, you know, the markup isn't necessarily a bigger markup. It's more expensive because people would pay fair wages yeah. to, to produce it. Um, what I uh, decided to do was that, uh, and this, again, I mean, we, we all figure out our own ways, and I, my ways are to be everyone else's way. I just decided to not buy new clothes. So I could even see myself buying a pair of Nike shorts if they're from a thrift store, because my, the money that I spend for that doesn't go to Nike, right? So, so you know, I would feel more, I, I mean, I try, I try not to buy any clothes that, that advertise a brand. So, um, so actually, chances are I probably wouldn't buy the Nike shorts, but but I can see myself doing that. So buying uh, from uh, buying from thrift stores might might be the thing, or other used. Uh, but again, it's difficult. People can't do all of that. If you're going to go to a job interview, um, you know, chances are you're not going to buy your suit at a thrift store. Um, uh, you know, trying to find a suit at a thrift store that fits you might take years. So. Um, but that's a way that, that I've done it. But again, I, I think it's just about being it's just about being more conscious. So if I can identify the, the corporations that are the worst abusers, maybe it's about avoiding them. Maybe it's about keeping my eye open for when things go on sale that are produced. I mean, I really struggle because I don't want to buy leather stuff because of my commitment to animal, I guess, animal exploitation. And I don't want to buy stuff that is made with unfair labor practices. To find something that is vegan and not made by unfair labor practices is almost impossible. Um, so, uh, you know, so it's a struggle. So my advice is just we do the best we can do, but because we can't all be perfect about it, we can at least commit to doing the best we can do. And that'll be different for all of us. Well, this whole idea of consumerism this idea that right now we're arguing with Congress because we're not supporting corporations enough. So even to get the information out to the public of who these abusers are is extremely difficult. Yes, absolutely. That's extremely, you know, there are some contexts in which I would give this presentation and I would be labeled a communist or un-American or uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, that's that's how hard it is. We had George W. Bush saying the best way to support your country during a time of war is to go shopping. Exactly. Um, and so that's part of it too. Part of it is just overall cutting down on consumerism. That if I have the iPhone 3, I do not need the iPhone 4, exactly. then I don't need the iPhone 5 because the iPhone 3 works just fine. You know, but this, this urge that we feel, the social cachet that comes with having the newest stuff, cool stuff, the cool clothes, that, uh, that the system, the consumer system in the clothing industry is designed to make us feel like we have to replace our wardrobe every couple of years because, ooh, I can't wear that anymore because it's, because it's not in style. That kind of thing, we can just say, I'm just not going to do that anymore. I'm not gonna, I, the way that I started with this is I made a decision one day, uh, every day on Thanksgiving, I decide to give up something for a year. And I was like, so one time I decided, I'm going to give up, uh, I'm not going to buy any new article of clothing for a year. That's what I decided. 
And the reason I do that isn't just because of that year, but it's because I start becoming more conscious of all the times I see something, and I'm like, ooh, I need that sweater. You know, I need, I need. So just being able to shift our consciousness from I need to I like that sweater. Do I actually need that sweater? Where did that sweater come from? How were the workers who created that sweater treated? So that I had this different thing going through, going through my head. Mm -hmm. Questions? Or comments? You know, there are some colleges and universities, there are some, especially some small colleges that are where the students have gotten together um, so much of a force that they, that they push the next one out. Um, so, you know, one thing I would encourage you to do, if you email me, I, I would send you some stuff, uh, is to contact, try to find the students who led those, uh, learn from, from how, how they do it. But raising some, some consciousness, and certainly, not giving Sodexo a diversity award. I almost fell over when I saw that. Mm -hmm. uh, questions, comments? If not, please join me in thanking our guests for, for the fact that we